Think Forward. Think Research Channel. I may be biased a little bit as a cardiologist, but I can't help thinking that the heart is really the coolest organ. And it's not often that a Scotsman uses the word cool. Um, it has four chambers. It has four different valves. It pushes blood around the heart in a serial system. It beats three billion times in an average lifetime. That constitutes 200 million liters of blood something like a million barrels of oil. The equivalent of a million barrels of oil is what the heart beats in, in its lifetime. Um, and that's equivalent of a, probably about three super tankers worth. So the heart's a pretty amazing muscle. It beats the whole time. It takes a little rest in between each beat. But other than that, it beats from the beginning of your life till the end. It supplies the brain. So the, the heart can actually um, not so, uh, the heart can, su can, su can supply the brain, but the heart will continue to beat even if the brain uh, is, is damaged. As you can see in, in the uh, picture above, we see the cutaway at the moment of the, the main pumping chambers, and you can see in the lighter color, the valves pushing the blood in, in one direction, so they come out. The upper filling chambers at the top, and the main pumping chambers at the bottom. The heart, of course, has a very central place in our language and in our culture, and has done for many years. Uh, Mary Gordon, I said, what a mystery the heart is. The mind is simple by comparison. Of course, we agree. Aristotle, way back in the, in the day, believed the heart to be the seat of pain, pleasure, and all sensation. And of course, Richard I was dubbed Lionheart to signify bravery. There's a lot of metaphors, and this were just a few I pulled together in about five or ten minutes last night. We like to think that we are pure of heart. We like to think that we're, we might have the heart of a lion. Uh, we, might, uh, we do a lot of learning by heart as a, in medical school. Hope some, some of us might be described as bleeding hearts. Um, hopefully we don't have hearts of stone, and hopefully we don't undergo too many heart-wrenching procedures. But as you can see, the heart is the center of much of our language. And many artists have focused on the heart, and here is just a small selection again of some of the uh, heart art that is out there on the internet and so readily available to us now. Well, here's a little trivia part of the evening. Uh, the biggest heart in the world, anyone, anyone got any ideas? Well, the biggest heart in the world belongs to this creature, which is the blue whale. The blue whale has a heart the size of a small car, believe it or not. Um, it uh, is probably the biggest creature ever to have been on the earth. Uh, there have been creatures as large as a basketball court, believe it or not, and uh, its heart beats at approximately 10 beats per minute. And here is an example of a whale heart. Not so long ago in 1959, you could publish in cardiology journals just by grabbing a whale heart and taking a few pictures of it. And here is a 256 pound heart from a blue whale. Actually similar in very many ways to the uh, human heart that uh, I showed in the first slide. What about the fastest heart? I said the blue whale went at 10 beats per minute. The fastest heart belongs to this little creature. It's a shrew. And in fact, its heart beats at 1,000 beats per minute, which is a lot. And probably it represents the absolute limit of, of heart, heart uh, rates in, in mammals. Well, what about the smallest heart? This is a picture I took myself. It's actually uh, of a mouse embryo, believe it or not. And the, my, this part in the middle of the screen you can see from here to here is one millimeter in diameter. And this inside the pouch is a mouse, uh, a mouse embryo. And this thing beating right here is the mouse embryo heart. And it's about 100 microns in diameter. And this is day eight. So this is day eight of its embryology, and it's just beginning to beat. And then through the ages, of course, our learning and understanding of the heart has taken us to a point where I hope we can understand diseases like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy back in the time of Hippocrates, 500 BC. It was thought the left side of the heart and the arteries were conduits for air rather than blood. 
Galen was one of the most famous physicians of all time in the early hundreds AD, and he thought that the blood passed through the septum of the heart. And, and then, of course, da Vinci, shown here on the right, uh, was one of the, some, some of the earliest uh, to, to do anatomical drawings of the heart. But it wasn't until this man at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, William Harvey, finally found capillaries that he found that the heart connected from left to right. And in fact, the blood was a, that was a circulating fluid that went from one side of the heart to the other. Well, and, and there were some early science as well in, in learning about the heart, and in particular learning about the uh, electrical system of the heart. This uh, gentleman from 1775 did some uh, not exactly politically correct uh, experiments with chickens. He, he gave them a shock to the head, found that the animal fell over lifeless. But miraculously, and this may be the first defibrillation in history, the, the animal arose with a second shock to the chest. Of course, being a scientist, he wanted to repeat the test a few times, and he found that after the experiment was repeated rather often, the hen was stunned, walked with some difficulty, did not eat for a day or night. But fortunately, there was a happy outcome for this experiment in that later uh, the hen was very well and even laid an egg. So this is one of the earliest cardiologists. We've moved on just a little bit from this these days, and we'll talk a little bit about implantable defibrillators later, which are somewhat further advanced than uh, sh giving shocks to hens. So what about the normal heart then? Uh, I like to think of the normal heart as, as being really a, a, it's, it's a pump, essentially, isn't it? It's a complicated pump, but it's there to push the blood around the body. And it has an electrical system to allow it to do that in a coordinated manner. And it has a fuel system because you have to get oxygen and blood to the heart itself. The heart muscle has to have its own fuel. So here's the electrical system of the heart shown here on the right. Uh, the pacemaker starts in this thing called the sinoatrial node up at the top left-hand corner. And that's in one of the atria. The atria are the filling compartments for the heart, the upper chambers, the ventricles being the lower chambers. And the pacemaker of the heart starts at the, at the, the right atrium there and passes its electrical activity down to the AV node, the atrioventricular node. And then from there, the electrical activity spreads out through these bundle branches to the rest of the heart. And it's this electrical system that allows the heart to beat in a coordinated manner so that the the atria fill the ventricles, and then the ventricles push the blood out together. Obviously, the output from one side of the heart has to equal the output from the other side. There's also a fuel system, and we're all, I think, familiar with the idea of coronary arteries, and having blockages in coronary arteries is what causes a heart attack. And the fuel system is very important, and shown here, there are three principal coronary arteries. On the left-hand side, there are two, and then on the right-hand side, one. And these supply the blood and oxygen to the heart. The heart uses, obviously, because it's in continual motion, uh, a lot of blood and oxygen. So that's the normal heart. That's some, a little bit about the heart through the ages and a little bit about uh, the heart and its position in our, in our culture. We're here really to talk tonight about when things go wrong, the abnormal heart, and in particular, this condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic just means to get larger. And uh, the heart muscle cells, you're born with a certain number, and you don't get any more. And, but what can happen is that the heart is a muscle, like any other, uh, and the muscle can get bigger. So the individual heart cells can get bigger. And when that happens, that's called hypertrophy. Cardiomyopathy, cardio is, is easy, of course, that means the heart, and myopathy just means muscle weakness. So in this case, we're talking about a disease where the heart gets bigger and has some form of muscle weakness. And you can see a picture of a normal heart on the left-hand side of the screen with the main left ventricle in the center. And the right ventricle there in blue, taking the deoxygenated blood. This is the filling chamber with the right atrium here. And just out of, out of the screen just here is the left atrium filling the left-hand side. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a heart with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see immediately that the left ventricle is much thicker. But more than that, one aspect of the heart, the septum, this wall between the two ventricles, is actually abnormally thicker. It's asymmetrically thicker compared to this lateral wall of the heart. And that's one of the interesting components of the disease and something that we deal with, and we'll talk a little bit more. So it's possible, seeing as you came along tonight, that you've heard of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy before, or perhaps you haven't, and you just wanted to come along and learn a little bit about it. For those who, who haven't read much, this is probably the place where you've heard of it before. Uh, because hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the number one cause of sudden death in athletes. And so I think when athletes who we think of as the fittest people in our population and particularly invulnerable 
uh, keel over and die. Of course, it's, it's a tragic event when anyone does, but it seems all the more tragic when someone who's at the height of their physical fitness does that. And so it's very common that uh, there are news stories, and, and this is often where many of us will have heard of this disease. Of course, it's not the only cause, but it is the single biggest cause and causes approximately a quarter of the, um, the episodes of, of sudden cardiac death in athletes. So probably that's where you've heard of the disease before. It has, it has many names, and uh, one, of our, uh, one of the real in, in, inspirations in this disease, a, a, a professor called Barry Marin from Minnesota, who spent his, really his whole life dedicated to this, this disease, he has a slide similar to this one that's absolutely filled with names, maybe 35 different names. Uh, the, the, that's the same disease, effectively, and was first described in 1958 uh, in a paper in the British Heart Journal. Uh, there are other names for it, and uh, it's very common amongst the cardiologists uh, outside of the main centres to, to use the term IHSS for, well, for idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis. And uh, we don't agree with the I, the H, the S, or the S, so we don't call it, we don't call it IHSS. It's also known as HOCM, H with an O, C, M, and the O in that case stands for obstructive. And this is because the asymmetry of the muscle wall can cause obstruction to the blood flowing out of the heart. Well, is it common? Well, in fact, the answer is, is very clear. It's, it's a rare disease, but amongst the rare diseases, it is the most common one. So one in 500 in the population is something that surprises most people uh, when I tell them that there's a disease out there that's as common as this that they maybe haven't heard of or, or don't appreciate too well. Of all the cardiovascular genetic diseases, the inherited cardiovascular diseases, it is the most common. But one in 500 still makes it uncommon overall for cardiology practice, and that's another reason why we argue that uh, looking after patients in a specialist centre is, is the answer. So it represents 1% of all cardiology outpatients. Males and females are affected equally, and uh, all races are affected. Well, if I was to show this slide maybe 20 years ago, uh, I wouldn't have, first of all, this slide uh, wouldn't have existed and it would have been blank. Uh, but also, we wouldn't have had a very great deal to say about this. The disease was described as an abnormal thickening in the absence of really any other reason like high blood pressure or a valve problem. Um, but over the last 10 years, pre pre uh, predominantly because of work at a number of laboratories around the country, principally at, at the Harvard lab of, of Cricket Seidman, um, we've actually found the genetic basis of this disease, and it was really very exciting. And this here is, is the sarcomere. Let me introduce you to the sarcomere. The sarcomere is the protein unit of contraction of heart muscle cells, and it's illustrated here. It's made up predominantly of, of three or four proteins. This myosin protein here is one of the main fibers. Uh, this, this actin is, is another one here. And I had a, a physiology teacher back in medical school who used to demonstrate the action of muscle contraction by getting up on the table. You'll be, Nora will be relieved to know I'm not going to do that this evening. Um, to, to do a demonstration of myosin rowing through the actin C. And he would actually get up and uh, do a rowing motion to remind us that what happens is that these heads here connect onto this actin molecule and literally pull. And so the muscle thickens as it uh, contracts. And uh, in, in addition, there's a number of other parts to that that calcium has to come in and bind up here to release this cleft so that these contractions can happen. And this is the sarcomere. So when we were thinking about what, what causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, one of the first places to look was these, were, were these protein units that really are the, the central part of contraction of the heart muscle. And when these uh, scientists looked for genetic mutations in these genes, they found, as you can see laid out on this slide, uh, very many of them. It is to the point now where probably about 70 to 80% of, of pa our patients, if we screen these genes, would be able to find the genetic mutation. 10 or 15 years ago, that was not possible at all, and that number would have been zero. So we've really moved forward a great deal because of the work of these laboratories in finding the underlying cause. So how do genetic mutations in the sarcomere contribute to a thickening of the heart? Well, essentially what they do is make the contraction at the molecular level less efficient. And the, that lack of efficiency uh, increases the energy uh, usage of the heart and causes the heart to, to thicken. It also causes this at a cellular level. And so this is a microscope slide of a normal heart here on the left. And you can see the lovely bundles of heart muscle fibers here. And the darker areas are the nuclei of the cells. But on the right, there is disarray. You can see it's chaotic. 
the, the cells are the same. The, the, the color change is not, uh, it's, it's just because they came from two different places. But you can see these swirls of heart muscle cells. And this is called myocardial fiber disarray and is part of the, of the disease process of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But then we tend to think of the heart as an organ, and I've been pushing towards that with you earlier today. And so, as well as on a molecular level and on a cellular level, there are changes that are manifest on an organ level, and they're shown here. Here's the normal heart again on the, on the left-hand side of the screen with the left ventricle, the left atrium, the right atrium, and the right ventricle. Here's the one we saw already, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, with the asymmetric septal hypertrophy. So here's the septum between the right and left ventricles. And here's the lateral wall. And you can see this is two to three times thicker than normal. One of the problems with that is you can see this outflow tract here. So the blood has to come in and then get out into this main artery here, the aorta. And this narrowed out, outflow tract here can cause a, a buildup of pressure within the heart. And it's one of the principal difficulties that we face in managing patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, not every patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a narrowed outflow tract. And some have a, a situation more like this, where the thickening is at the apex of the heart. Some people have a thickening of the heart that's symmetrical all the way around. And there are really a number of different uh, uh, patterns of disease. And as we learn more about the genetics, we learn that there are some correlation between the pattern of the disease and the gene involved. So these are the pictures uh, that we actually see. Um, and we usually use echocardiogram. So that's an ultrasound, which is very much like the same ultrasound we use to look at babies in the womb. Uh, and you can see up on the top left, first of all, this is the ultrasound from a normal person, actually an athlete, um, who was participating in an ultra marathon, hence the low heart rate, around 30 beats per minute. And you can see a, a heart muscle thickness of about one centimeter here. This is the left atrium that was at the top of the other picture, the main pumping chamber here, and then the blood coming out of the aorta. So that's normal, and then this is a little bit slow, but here's the same picture, but from a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see immediately, first of all, the thickness of this heart muscle here and here. And it's a little bit jumpy, I'm sorry about that. But you can see also the cavity is, is completely obliterated with every beat. And one of the aspects of the disease is that, that the, the cavity is, uh, is obliterated because of very uh, significant contraction. And some of our treatments are aimed at holding back that significant contraction. In a small number of cases, about 5% of cases, what happens is that eventually the heart dilates and becomes thin again. And here is the heart of someone who is just pre-heart transplant. And you can see here a big cavity again and a very thinned wall with a very, very minimal contraction. And so this is the spectrum of, of possible disease. I would want to emphasize at this point and, and at many other points that uh, these are the severe versions that I'm showing and that for many patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they have a normal existence, don't take any medicines, live a completely normal lifespan and die of something else. And that's something we, we make a point of telling all our patients in the clinic. But what problems does it cause then? Um, and these are the, the principal ones. Uh, chest pain is, is not uncommon. It's not the same chest pain as people who are having a heart attack tend to have with a, a central crushing pain, 10 out of 10, like an elephant sitting on the chest. It tends to be more, a more atypical pain with little shooting signs and maybe a little bit further up on the chest. Shortness of breath on exertion and poor exercise tolerance are very common. Um, and occasional lightheadedness, either because not enough blood is getting out on a beat-to-beat -beat basis or sometimes uh, because of dangerous rhythms that can happen. What do we do for management? Well, uh, one of the first things we do, and you'll hear about this a little later from our patient who's been kind enough to join us, is we avoid high, we recommend the patients avoid high intensity exercise for the reasons that would be obvious from the fact that this is the number one uh, cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes. It seems that high intensity exercise, and particularly sports like basketball, are very risky. And so one of the first things that we do is ask them to, to, to do less intense exercise. We don't want people being sedentary, but uh, we, we don't recommend burst type activities and high intensity exercise. Because it's a genetic disease, we always do family screening. And there are, there are some medicines that we use to try and help with the very positive, the very powerful contraction. And then we also deal with these three things, protection with an implantable defibrillator. We talked about the obstruction with the blood not being able to make it out of the heart, and there are some techniques for that. And finally, and a very small percentage, actually, of, of these patients' heart transplantation. 
So here's one of our, our tables that we give to some patients about avoiding sport, and this comes from a, uh, an expert group uh, headed up by Dr. Marin that I mentioned earlier. And they, to try and help patients, they actually went through a lot of the sports and gave them a grading uh, where zero to one indicated that it wouldn't really be advised and uh, a higher number, four or five, would re recommend that uh, the sport was probably okay. And you can see right at the top it with a, a score of zero is, is basketball. Um, a little further down, you can see some of the sports like biking and um, jogging have slightly higher scores. And these are the activities that we tend to, to recommend. Family screening can be done in two ways. The ultrasounds I showed earlier, uh, echocardiograms are, are done of first degree relatives and family members. And we can also increasingly do genetic screening uh, to look at the mutations in these genes that uh, were, were mentioned earlier. Um, and we have a, a system set up in our clinic uh, to do uh, genetic counselling and to bring in the family members and, and to provide them information uh, and reassurance and to be able to do that as fast as possible. Well, medicines. So we're all familiar with medicines in one form or another. We're going to go back inside the cell for a minute now. Um, and this is the heart muscle cell again, seen from a slightly different angle. Uh, and this time, the time is, is one contraction of the heart. The little blue dots here are calcium. And the uh, heart muscle cell, as I mentioned earlier, contracts when calcium enters from the outside. Uh, and so we should, see, should loop around and we'll see again. This is called a T-tubule, and the calcium flows down here and in through this calcium channel, which is this green, uh, slightly alien-looking thing just here. That was the electrical impulse. Here's a little bit of calcium that comes in, and then a lot of calcium is released from this intracellular store. And then these are the myofibrils. This is the, the myosin and the actin that are, are rowing through each other in order to cause a contraction. Um, so calcium channel blockers are one of the medicines that we use, and they block this channel here. So they stop the calcium, these little blue dots, going into the cell, which, as you can imagine, would reduce the force of contraction of the heart. And that's our aim in these, in these situations, is to reduce the force of contraction. Because if the heart's trying to push the blood out past an obstruction, then we really need to, we need to calm the heart uh, down and slow it down a little bit. That can reduce the obstruction and reduce the, the danger with uh, a very highly forceful heart contraction. Um, beta blockers work by reducing the effect of adrenaline on the heart. Uh, and stored in this little component here are uh, receptors for adrenaline that actually also cause an increase in contraction via an increase in calcium. And so we're sort of blocking calcium indirectly. And those are two of the mechanisms by which we use medicines to try and control things in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We talked about protection and uh, we talked a little bit about the chickens at the beginning. This is a little bit more sophisticated and uh, I hope that, uh, I, think I suspect many of you by now have heard about implantable defibrillators. This has really changed the, the whole uh, scenario for our patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because for so long we knew they were at somewhat increased risk of sudden death um, but we weren't really able to do a lot about it other than use the medicines. And we're in a new era now where we can pinpoint the patients who have a high risk and recommend that they have an implantable defibrillator. Um, and this is like a small pacemaker device that's placed under the left clavicle or, or the right, depending on, um, on handedness. And that's, this is the device here. And leads, it could be one lead or two leads, and occasionally uh, not so much in these patients, but in other patients it could be three leads. Um, but one principal lead goes in through the right-hand side of the heart, the right atrium here, all the way into the right ventricle, and this little lead is actually screwed into the heart. And it connects to this box up here, and this box monitors the heart, and it essentially monitors every single heartbeat. And if a dangerous rhythm occurs in the heart, then it has a series of, of algorithms within it to control the dangerous rhythm. It can pace the heart very fast, and if necessary and all else fails, if there's a dangerous rhythm, then it will deliver a shock. And this is exactly the same as we see on TV when the paddles are, are put on from the outside and a shock's delivered from the outside. But this is done from the inside and obviously is something that is carried around because it's implantable. Well, what about the obstruction? This becomes a problem for many people. The asymmetric nature of the hypertrophy uh, can cause a problem and can cause symptoms and high pressures within the heart. Well, back in 1961, Andrew Morrow, who I learned this morning actually had the disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy himself, but was also a cardiac surgeon, uh, developed this operation called the myectomy operation. And ectomy, as I'm sure you're familiar, usually means removal. So myectomy means literally going into the heart, 
and chopping out a bit of it. And this is what's illustrated here. You go in through the aortic valve, which is here, with the scalpel, and you literally chop out a little bit of the extra heart. And we do this here at Stanford, and at one point, uh, we were actually doing more than any other centre in the country of these operations. Uh, Andrew Morrow himself described that the incisions were made close to the seat of the soul. Um, and I think any time you're cutting into the heart, um, you, you obviously have some weary. Also, it's close not just to the seat of the soul, but the seat of the electrical activity of the heart. And you might remember from the earlier slide that the electrical branches come through this part. And so one of the difficulties with the operation is uh, avoiding those electrical bundle branches. Well, cardiologists, of course, are always looking for new ways of doing things and maybe less invasive ways. And there's an, a, a procedure that's also available at Stanford and, and recommended for a select group of patients called alcohol septal ablation. And believe it or not, this is causing a heart attack. This is going into one of the coronary arteries and actually injecting alcohol to cause a, a controlled heart attack. And it, what it does, the idea is to take away this area of thickened muscle shown up here um, by causing a small heart attack in that area. And the advantage of it, of course, is that it's not an open heart procedure. It's done in the cath cardiac catheterization lab. It takes about an hour. Um, it's only a, a non-invasive uh, line is put in through the top of the leg. And the, uh, then this catheter is passed up and the alcohol injected. Um, there are downsides, of course, to many things. And we're really just in the early days of knowing about this condition. Causing a heart attack, of course, comes with all the uh, complications that we know about. And so these are two alternatives, and they, all, they both have their place. And so we... In our centre, we would try and choose and work with the patient to see if they had obstruction that needed some intervention, which of these two things was uh, possible. I thought I'd leave you with this other story. We've talked a lot about electricity, and uh, one of the ways of monitoring for the disease uh, is using an electrocardiogram. An electrocardiogram was invented not by a, a, a Dutchman, as most people believe, but by a Scotsman, uh, <laughs> of course. Um, who was called Augustus Waller, and he trained uh, in Edinburgh and then at St Mary's in London. And he used to do demonstrations, including at one point in the House of Commons, with his dog, who was called Jimmy. And uh, he would put Jimmy, uh, would put all four paws uh, in, in uh, glass beakers of uh, saline, so salty water. And then he would do an electrocardiogram and electrical tracing of his dog. And you can see he caused uh, some outrage in the House of Commons in the early 1900s uh, because he did the first ECG uh, actually, the Royal Society, uh, with his paws in the salt solution, that's his dog, of course. Uh, this prompted irate spectators to write a letter to the Lancet, and they complained that the poor dog had undergone an ordeal by electricity, being forced to stand in water containing the intensively corrosive metal sodium and the very poisonous gas chlorine. And, and my favourite part is, of course, the end, where it says, worse still, there were at least two bishops in the audience. <laughs> Terrible terrible days. So with that, I would uh, like to do just a little bit of gratuitous self-promotion. Um, I have a book called Cardiology Explained. If you were interested in having any other aspects of cardiology explained, it is available. It's at the health library. Uh, and then also, uh, importantly, we have a website for the Stanford Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center with a little bit more information about the disease there. And some of the images you've seen from the presentation, which were debuted this evening, are going to appear on the website in the very near future. So with that, I'd, I'd like to uh, hand over, and it really gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Lisa Solberg here, really to Stanford, and she's here on a two-day visit, and we were lucky enough to be able to coincide the visit with the, the talk this evening. Um, she's, really a, uh, she's really very famous within hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and um, as easily as famous as any of the doctors who've been researching this for years. She's been a powerhouse in, in advocating for patients, and, and really, we, we are amazingly grateful to her already in, in these early days of us setting up our own centre here. She's been unbelievably helpful, and so um, really, it gives me great pleasure to, to ask her to come and chat to you for a little bit about her efforts in this way. Thank you. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association and centers of excellence and why they're important. So first of all, where am I from? I'm from the other side of the country, that little star there. That happens to be a place called Hibernia, New Jersey. You probably have no idea where Hibernia, New Jersey is. Don't feel bad, nobody does, because it really doesn't exist as a town. It's a part of a town outside of New York, in the middle of nowhere, in the country in New Jersey. And yes, there is country in New Jersey. So that's where, New Jer or where Hibernia, New Jersey is. So why is it important to have a patient advocacy organization for a disease like HCM? Let me talk to you about living with this disease. First, you're diagnosed. 
And that brings questions. You leave the doctor's office and he's told you you have something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and you say hypo what? And you don't understand anything. You just know you've been told you have a heart problem. You're confused. You're home, you're filled with concern, you're trying to ask your friends and neighbors about this, but probably nobody's ever heard of it. So you go on a search for information, and this being the information age, you normally head to the internet. But who do you trust? There's a lot of information on the internet, and not all of it is equal. There's some really bad information on the web, and normally if you search for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're going to hear something called sudden cardiac arrest or sudden death, and it's a very scary term. Fortunately, it's a very real term for a number of families, and they've experienced it, but it's not normally the case for people with HCM to have to live with a very high risk for having sudden cardiac arrest. So we hope that these patients become educated, and in that education, there's some comfort and knowledge. We want them to become friends with their hearts. I know that sounds a little idealistic, but if you understand what's inside, you can understand what you can do to protect yourself, and then you get on with living. And the HCMA is all about living with HCM. But that then brings us to the next part of this problem and starts it all over again. Because this is a genetic condition, we have to screen the family members. And that doesn't mean just your children. We, we refer to it as going up, over, and down. You have to go up to your parents, over to your siblings, down to your children, and then potentially out to your cousins and their children and so on and so forth. This is a very time-consuming process, and when you're the information guru of the family, it can be very stressful. We're looking for answers for a lot of different issues in HCM, and I would like to discuss for just a few moments some of the misdiagnoses that we see at the HCMA. The most common misdiagnosis is asthma, specifically athletically-induced asthma. If somebody you know has been told they have athletically-induced asthma, please get a pulmonary function test to confirm the diagnosis of asthma and rule out cardiac involvement. Mitral valve prolapse, a lot of people are told they have MVP, mitral valve prolapse, only for it to be found out to be HCM at a later date. Ask your doctor specifically about your heart function and your, and your wall measurements if MVP has been suggested. Panic attack, anxiety, and depression are also often misdiagnosed. Not that these exist, don't exist on their own or maybe in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but oftentimes the symptoms can mimic symptoms of HCM such as palpitations and uh, dizziness. So who to screen, when to screen, and how to screen? In an HCM family, we screen all children every 12 to 18 months between the ages of onset of puberty, or approximately 12, till full grown, age approximately 20, and then every five years in an adult family member. And that's with an echo, an EKG, and a checkup with a cardiac professional. Care, finding doctors who understand. Uh, now we're starting to get a little more specific as to why I'm here in Stanford today. Because we need centers of excellence, because this is a complicated disease with a lot of different possibilities in treatment and disease presentation. So you need somebody who really understands the idiosyncrasies of HCM and teaching patients how to take care of themselves. Lifestyle issues. We don't sit in a chair when we're diagnosed with HCM and wait to die. We're out there working, living, raising our families. We have to be active members of society. So we have to learn where our limits are and how to take good care of ourselves. We have to manage our disease in the workplace. And we have to learn how to deal with our friends and families and communicate what's going on with them so we can be part of society. We provide a very active internet community because HCM is a relatively uncommon disease, although one in 500 means approximately 600,000 people in the United States alone have HCM. We don't have a lot of people in any one community with the disease, so the internet has become our cyber community and you can come there and visit. We're fact-based, we have medically moderated information on the message boards and on the internet. We provide a message board community for people to communicate with each other in a non-judgmental fashion, and it's moderated by people who are trained. This kind of, you can't read the whole thing because it's kind of tiny from back there, but this woman's from Toronto, Canada, actually, and her child was diagnosed 12 days before with HCM. She thought the world was ending and her child was about to die and didn't have a future, but found the message board, got some support from people, found out that there were options, and was feeling much better 12 days later. 
that's a very quick turnaround. We have people who have been out there for 20, 30 years without support and have been felt all alone for that amount of time. Why is there a need for advocacy within this particular disease? Some of the patients will get devices, implantable defibrillators and pacemakers. That's about 20 to 25 percent of our population. About 20 to 25 percent, not the same 25 percent in some cases, uh, will need septal reduction such as the myectomy or alcohol septal ablation with myectomy being the gold standard for treatment. About 12 to 15 percent will end up in atrial fibrillation and about 5% or less will end up with heart transplant and some people will go on to heart failure symptoms. It's a variety of different possibilities and some patients won't ever have a symptom. All of these people have the genetic implications associated with the disease, they're living with a chronic illness every day, and there's the ongoing need for family screenings and a need for advocacy on legislative issues of importance to the community such as genetic non-discrimination, CLIA approved labs to do genetic testing, and then there's advocacy on health insurance issues and life insurance issues. What do we advocate for on behalf of HCM patients? We believe that HCM centers of excellence are imperative to quality care for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and I am absolutely ecstatic to tell you today that I've spent the last day here at Stanford learning about their new HCM program, and I think you're very lucky you have buy-in from every level of this organization, every discipline within cardiology, genetics, you've got it all right here at Stanford and they're, they're gonna do a really good job for you here. And we are hoping that we will build HCM centers around this country so that no patient with HCM is more than a five hour drive away from quality care. Now does having an HCM center mean your local hometown cardiologist is not important? Absolutely not. You need that relationship with the hometown cardiologist and you need to be referred to an HCM Center of Excellence for evaluation to make sure that your care is on par with the current understanding of the disease. I've been doing what I do for 11 years. In the past 11 years, the treatment of HCM has changed drastically. We have new treatment options, we have ICDs that are implanted more frequently, drug therapy has been altered slightly, some medications fall out of favor, others come in too. We learn more about the disease every day. That's why it's important to be tied in with the Center of Excellence who's right on top of what's going on with the disease. We also want to ensure that all patients are well educated and become knowledgeable consumers of healthcare. We don't want people wasting their time at a doctor that doesn't understand HCM and we don't want the medical system wasting money on treatment that's not going to do anybody any good. So if a patient is well educated and know the questions to ask, then you're going to get better quality care living with HCM and not in fear of it. I was diagnosed with HCM when I was 12 years old. At that time, two family members had already died from the disease, my grandfather and my aunt. Since then, I have had a stroke, secondary to subacute bacterial endocarditis, which is a bacterial infection inside of your heart. Through a clot, had a stroke three weeks after I was married. Two years after that, I had my first pacemaker. Five years to the day from my stroke, my sister died at the age of 36. My uncle had died actually the week after I had my stroke. So I've lost four family members to sudden death. I've been through hell and back myself with the disease, but I'm here. My daughter is 11 years old. She has an implantable defibrillator to protect her from sudden cardiac arrest. My niece is 22 years old. She too has an ICD to protect her. My father will be 72 in April. He has an ICD to protect him. And in fact, last February, it saved his life. I've been there, I've done that, and I wrote the book too. <laughs> so this is my gratuitous self-promotion. So uh, I have authored two books on the subject matter of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I've done that so that we can share the knowledge that I've learned because of the tragedies my family has been through. And in this journey that I've taken, we've helped to educate thousands of patients about their disease, build HCM programs around the country, and work towards changing legislation on the national and local level to improve patient care, to improve your rights to genetic privacy, and to raise awareness about a disease that is far more common than most people think. One in 500 is an awful lot of people. And within this room tonight, I know there's at least two of us in here. There might be more, um, but I know that there's at least two of us here. 
Uh, the other things that we advocate on behalf of is full disclosure from device manufacturers in the event of change in um, their availability of data on reliability of devices. And generally raising awareness about sudden cardiac arrest in the young. It's not just elderly people who have cardiac arrest and die, and also to know the difference between a cardiac arrest and a heart attack. Cardiac arrest is an electrical problem of the heart. It has nothing to do with what you ate for dinner. Not fat, not cholesterol. So here's some facts that back my position as to why a center of excellence is important. We've done some, screen, or we've done some surveying of physicians uh, from the American Heart Association Conference, American College of Cardiology, and the Heart Rhythm Society. And we asked them what they knew about HCM. Now these are just general physicians and nurses in cardiology. We asked them, when do you need to screen a child in an HCM family? Only 53% of them got the answer right. 13% said only once through adolescence, and that's when they're highest risk for de developing disease. So 47% answered wrong, and that's not good enough for me. When asked what the prevalence of the disease was, and given three options, one in 10,000, one in 2,500, or one in 500, only 35% got it right. So if 65% got it wrong, do you think people are really looking for this disease out in the community, or do they think it just doesn't exist? When asked what the risk factors for sudden cardiac arrest in an HCM patient were, only 12% got all the answers right, and you can see they were all over the board with their answers. What was most disheartening about this data was that 70% of the respondents claimed to be treating an HCM family, but they weren't getting the answers right nearly at all. So we need to make sure that we have good continuity of care by somebody who understands. And what we've done at the HCMA was a survey of our patient population who have been to an HCM Center of Excellence, and we asked them a number of questions. But the most important to me was, did they feel that being treated by an HCM specialty center improved their quality of life? Because when we get right down to the end of it, that's what we're trying to do, improve quality of life. And 67% said yes, it improved their quality of life, definitely. 15.6% said yes, somewhat, and 17% said no. Does that mean the HCM Center didn't do a good job? Well, there may not have been much to do to improve quality of life, and some of these people may have moved on to heart transplant. So it doesn't mean that the center didn't do a good job. It means that they've been maximized on their quality of life. So I will leave you with these thoughts about HCM specialty centers being integral to care, but also with the note that HCM is not a disease that is inherently bad, but it is an inherited cardiac disease that is important and is definitely compatible with a normal life. I don't look like a cardiac patient. At least I don't think I do, unless I'm having a really bad day. But on most days I don't look like a cardiac patient, and it is something that um, I am. It's part of who I am. So if you want more information about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I encourage you to visit our website at the number 4hcm.org on the internet. Visit our community, and I can't say thank you enough to my wonderful hosts here at Stanford, and I am pleased to have been here. Thank you. I'd like to introduce just to talk for a few minutes about our approach at Stanford, someone who I'm very lucky to work with, and that's Heidi Salisbury, who's our nurse coordinator for the Stanford ECM Center. You've heard about centers of excellence and why they're important, but I wanted to tell you about what our center embodies. HCM patients um, have been at Stanford for a de over a decade, and our center now has been uh, running full force for over six months. Most importantly, we have cardiovascular medicine um, and diagnostics, which includes echocardiogram, EKG, stress testing, and VO2. And then we have um, our cardiologists, cardiovascular nursing, electrophysiology, interventional cardiology, cardiac imaging, cardiovascular surgery, and genetics. In addition to all of that, we have community outreach and patient participation. And you can see, um, having been able to sit here and listen to Lisa, how important that is. And then you'll meet James, who's one of our patients. Um, in terms of the goals for our center, a lot of patients come to us to clarify their diagnosis, and that's usually the most important thing, to clarify diagnosis, to educate them, to learn as much about them as we possibly can as well, and then to create a treatment plan, and then to plan for their future. Everyone wants to know what happens next. Um, as a nurse, a lot of 
what I do is gather information, help the patient bring all the information together, um, get everything on the table so that we can address our goal. I'm going to start off with talking about my experience with finding out I actually had HCM. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I was getting a basketball it's called physical with a chiropractor and he was in my local small town of Oakley, California. And it was actually, I thought it was just going to be really fast, you know, in and out, no problems whatsoever. But he looks at me and he says, you know, your, your wingspan's pretty big and I have a 6'5 wingspan and I'm 6'1. And that's actually a characteristic he thought and said of Marfan's disease. And so my mom and I, we both said, no, I don't have Marfan's, I don't have anything wrong with me. So he said, but I really want you to go see a specialist. So I went to see a heart specialist and, um, in Pleasanton, actually, I think it was. And he said, no, I, I don't think you have Marfan's whatsoever. He said, let me, let me be safe anyway and run some tests, run the EKG and all that, all that good dandy stuff. And um, found out that it looked like I had HCM. So he sent me here to Stanford and to meet the crew and everybody. And um, they told me that I definitely had HCM. And that was pretty tough for me because I played basketball my, pretty much my whole life been an active kid, running around, jumping, getting in trouble, stuff like that. And to be told that I couldn't play basketball anymore, to, you know, just take a break just to see for sure if I had it, because um, Dr. Ashley was actually trying to see if it might have been um, physically induced because I was really active, maybe seven or eight hours of working out or basketball a day, and that is a lot. But um, it turned out I actually really did have it. And so we got started on, on putting the defibrillator in. And, you know, everybody was great here. I mean, Heidi, of course, setting me up with all the information, trying to make me feel comfortable, feeding me, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and it was really a great experience to be here and to be with all these people. And it's, it really is a, a good program. The question is, uh, to, if I could talk a little bit more about the genetic testing. Um, so the genetic testing involves essentially sequencing, so looking at every alphabetic letter of eight genes. These are the most common genes that have been shown to be responsible for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are other genes out there that are also known uh, to cause them, but these ones cause by far the majority. And as I mentioned earlier, probably about 70 or 80 percent of, of patients will a gene mutation will be found with that panel. Uh, the test is, is pretty intensive and unfortunately fairly expensive. It costs a few thousand dollars um, and it's a lot of work to do that. But finding the actual mutation in one family then means a much simpler test can be done in other family members. Um, because once the mutation is found, a very short and, and quick test can be done in the, other family, in the other family members. The question was about what's the genetic transmission? of the disease. Some of you might have heard about autosomal dominant diseases or X-linked diseases or recessive diseases. In this case, you only need to have one bad copy of the gene. And because of, really because of the way the, the protein complex is made up inside the cell, inside the heart muscle cell, um, it seems that you only really need one bad copy to cause the disease itself. And that's where the phrase dominant negative comes from. Uh, and so, and it tends to be, so it, there's a 50% chance of a first degree relative having the disease. So for example, if a father had the disease, a 50% chance of passing it to the son or daughter. He says he's been diagnosed with a mild case of HCM and, and I have to have a little fun with this because it's HCM and you have to have some fun. We refer to it as having HCM or not because it's kind of like being a little bit pregnant. It's a yes or a no and how the disease presents itself in you may be a mild presentation but the fact that you have it does indicate that your children should be screened regardless of their age, even if they're adult children. And if they have children, we will have to evaluate whether or not those children should need to be reviewed right now or they may want to wait depending upon the physician referral. The question is, if you have the gene, does that mean you'll have HCM? And that speaks a little bit to exactly how we define the disease. The disease at the moment is really defined by echocardiography by having a thick heart in the absence of another cause. 
So if, if that's the definition, then there are people who carry the gene mutations in families who don't have HCM by the definition of they don't have a thick heart. But I think that we're really changing our definition of the disease to really be a genetic one. And to, so, so that we would say, in fact, that person who has the gene mutation does have the disease. It's just not at a point yet at which it's clinically important. One of the challenges, although we, I think we've made great progress in understanding the genetic basis of the disease, is that there's a great deal of variability. So for example, two brothers who have the same gene mutation could have quite different presentations. One could present in age 15 with very severe symptoms. One could be 65 years old and have very mild symptoms. And that's something we don't understand, unfortunately, whether the, there are speculations. Maybe there are some other genes, modifier genes, that are playing a role. Maybe there are other environmental factors we don't understand. The question is, why multiple screenings in an HCM family? We don't exactly know when this disease is going to actually present itself. As we were talking earlier, this is a genetic disease, and we're not exactly sure what triggers the disease to manifest itself with hypertrophy. And it normally, it's most common to show up during puberty. So anytime during puberty, you can have a child who has a completely normal heart at age 12, and by age 13, there's significant hypertrophy present. In some cases, it may be 12 years old, it's fine, 13, it's fine, but by 15 or 16, you'll see the hypertrophy. And if you look at the numbers of sudden deaths that occur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the age in which you're at the highest risk is approximately age 15 to age 22. So we really want to be very clear that we're paying very close attention to that adolescent population and following them with screenings every 12 to 18 months. But as evident by the gentleman who was just diagnosed, who does not appear to be 20, um, you can present with this disease at any age, even into your 60 or 70th decade. So you're, you're 60, 70 years old and you're just showing up with the disease, does that mean you shouldn't screen your children? No, you should go back and screen the adult children because in all likelihood, if we had looked earlier, we probably would have found it. So we have to make sure we're checking everybody. You know, I thought I was perfectly fine. My friends, family, everyone said I was gonna be fine and be able to get back into basketball with no problem at all. But I think it is very important to have multiple screenings if someone does have it. And um, it's very important. I'm only 19. I just, we just discovered when I was 18, right? Yeah, so. So the question was about insurance companies and whether they cover the screening. And Lisa probably could answer this even better than I, but I think that's, the simple answer is that the echocardiographic screening, our standard screening, is, is always covered. Uh, but the genetic screening is... The genetic screening is not always covered. It's a policy by policy basis. And actually, wherever you are in the country and whatever is going on in your region will dictate more so than on a national standard right now. Right now, we're getting them paid for, I'd say, 60 to 70 percent of policies will pay something for genetic testing. We've not gotten anybody to pay 100 percent yet, but we're getting up to 70 to 90 percent. Um, the testing runs approximately $3,000 for one panel, another $1,000 $1, to $1,200 for additional panels. Uh, so it is very costly, but most of the genetic mutations are found in the first panel in the most common three to four genes. question was about um, symptoms. I had absolutely no symptoms. I played basketball. Um, okay, I went to school 1.30. Um, got, off, got out of school at 1.30, I mean. Played basketball at the gym for about two hours, no, nonstop, no short breathing, nothing like that. Went to the gym, worked out for two and a half, sometimes three hours and then went to basketball practice for another two hours. And I had no problem breathing whatsoever. I mean, I was in, I was in really, really good shape. And I felt perfectly fine. Everyone thought I was fine and nothing like that ever. But he, 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 he didn't. Uh, and we do see a number of patients in whom that's the case, that they end up actually with no symptoms. The most common symptoms are actually the ones that you mentioned, shortness of breath, fatigue, a kind of atypical chest pain that's hard to pin down. Those things are, are, are common are palpitations. One. When I was his age, I didn't really have many symptoms either. Uh, through age, my dear, through age, um, <laughs> they do come. Um, and it's shortness of breath with exercise or walking up hills. 
Um, not so much flat surfaces. Normally people with HCM do pretty well on flat surfaces, but put an incline or a short hill or stairs, you get short of breath there, palpitations, dizziness, fatigue, and in some rare cases, fainting. The question is about the cellular basis of the disease and the, the fiber disarray that we mentioned is caused by the molecular change in the molecular machinery. Um, is it progressive? That's one of the questions. I, I think we think of this on a cellular level and then on an organ level. Uh, in a small percentage of patients, about 5%, there is a progressive disease with a thickening of the heart. It turns out uh, to, it ends up, the heart becomes thinner over time and then dilates. And so on an organ level that happens. What exactly happens with a fiber disarray is, is less clear at that time. I think it's fairly stable within that. Fibrosis is that the, the space between the cells becomes greater and fibrotic tissue, an extra kind of connective tissue, uh, is filling those spaces during that time. Uh, the molecular change is, is the same uh, the whole time. So there's an interesting study we were just talking about yesterday, and we think, of course, one of the other things we do at Stanford, we didn't talk too much in, in the talk because we've been focused on the clinical management here, but we have a, a strong research program that we're getting off the ground and moving forward. And we're really interested in doing everything we can to, to reverse some of these changes if possible. And so we're looking at the molecular machinery and we're doing s experiments in, in cells and we're doing experiments in mouse models to see if it is possible to change it. And there's one, not from our lab so far, but there's one very interesting study from another lab that shows that if you turn off the abnormal gene, and of course that's the challenge is, is doing that. It's, it's easy to do that in a, in a mouse model, but much harder to do, to do it in a human. That's our, the challenge that's ahead for us. But if you turn off that gene, it's actually possible the cellular disarray will reverse. And that's really, I think, a fascinating opportunity for, for many of us. The question was of whether, the, because we're using calcium channel blockers, uh, could they're changing the dietary calcium have a similar kind of effect? And the answer really is no, and, and, and that's because the, the body, your body really regulates the amount of calcium in your blood pretty uh, aggressively. And so, um, obviously, if you go to the real extremes, then you may have an effect on your circulating calcium, but for the most part, you have to, to be on the very extreme end to do that. Um, so it wouldn't have a, a similar effect. This is a very targeted effect of a calcium channel blocker drug on that little um, calcium channel into the heart. Another great question uh, regarding if some of these symptoms, uh, should, would they precipitate a screening study for, for people who may have some of these symptoms? Of course, the, the symptoms are very, uh, are very generic. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of things can cause shortness of breath, things in the lungs, uh, things in the heart. Um, there's a lot of things can cause chest pain, things in the, in the chest wall, the heart, the lungs, the, all the contenders are there. Um, I think my advice would be if there's a symptom about which you have some concern that seems to be getting worse, I would see in the first case your, your primary care. Um, and, and then absolutely, I think if it felt it was, uh, if your primary care felt that it was indicated and that there wasn't a clear explanation, then um, usually they're the best person to decide whether it should be a, a lung doctor or a heart doctor. To, to go and see. I think it can be hard sometimes with the symptom which can come from several different systems to know which subspecialist to, to see. And so the primary care doctor I think can be a great resource in terms of, of pushing you in the right direction. I'll add one thing to that. If in doubt, don't take no for an answer. You have one heart. You've got one chance. Don't let a doctor, all due respect to my dear friend here, intimidate you not to go for a test. And there are wonderful doctors out there, we all know, but there are some who might not take into account what you're saying. Don't be afraid to be an advocate for yourself. And if you don't feel that you can be that advocate for yourself to really push that you need something additional, bring somebody with you on the doctor's appointment who can help you advocate for yourself. It's your life, it's your health, you are your consumer of health care. Speak up for yourself. I knew too many people who wanted to be polite and didn't push, and then they end up in real trouble. So ask while you're feeling well. So the, I, there's a very important point if the, there has been an impression that this disease could be athletically induced because it, it absolutely cannot. 